Hi friends, thank you for joining us again for the ASP Stories weekend bonus episode. Join us on Mondays and Thursdays where we interview amazing guests where they share with us about their adventure sports and the amazing feats that they have done. But ASP Stories is where we get to listen in as authors read their adventure stories to us. So sit back with your hot cup of tea or coffee and kick off your adventure-filled weekend by listening in while we hear more from ASP Stories. Greetings, Adventure Sports Podcast listeners. This is Brian Snyder of Santa Barbara, California, getting ready to share with you another tale from my off-the-map trilogy of adventure books. Each collection showcases the best of the many bad decisions I've made in pursuit of the most surreal and scenic outdoor experiences our planet has to offer. Today's stories come from the third book, published last summer, titled Falling Off the Map, 54 Explorations into the Wildest Reaches of the American West. I've noticed this book has a lot of animal stories in it. We'll save the grizzly bear episodes for another time. Today, we'll delve into two of the rare chapters when I'm not traveling solo, and we'll see what critters we encounter. The first tale is called Week One, Fearless. I'm coming in, I warned Kitty, who was hiding in the tent, taking shelter from the droves of mosquitoes swarming outside. Okay. Can my friends come in too? I teased. No! The mosquitoes were no laughing matter, apparently but we would have to come to terms with the bloodthirsty parasites sooner or later if we were going to survive three days in the Yosemite backcountry. Perhaps a truce or a state of social equilibrium could be reached. As long as I was the one outside the tent, assigned to the role of chief wildlife negotiator, I suppose I was responsible for coming up with a solution. Thus far, offering my skin as tribute had failed to appease the swarms. I could only hope for better luck in the morning. This trip had been meant to kickstart my summer hiking season and serve as a last hurrah for Kitty, who was scheduled for wrist surgery upon our return to Southern California. Yosemite seemed like a suitable playground for our ambitions. The National Park was celebrating its 150th anniversary of the, of the Yosemite Grant when President Abraham Lincoln signed an act protecting Yosemite Valley and the Mariposa Grove of giant sequoias. That was the first time our federal government ever set aside wild lands purely for the public's use and enjoyment. Unfortunately, after just seven hours on the trail, part of me wanted my tax money back, because I certainly wasn't feeling much enjoyment with so many winged demons hovering about. At least the scenery was inspiring. Granite domes lurked like ghosts through openings in the forest, looming still, silent, and deathly white. These monoliths were but spectral shadows of the volcanoes that once ruled this landscape. Our 30-mile backpacking journey began in the high meadows amongst these smaller granite specimens, and would eventually take us down towards the titans that dominated the lower Yosemite Valley, like Half Dome and El Capitan. It was a relief to escape the tumultuous tourist presence of Yosemite Valley, which receives four million visitors each year. The downside of our scheme to find solitude was that each human in the park's upper meadows receives four million mosquito visitors this time of year. On our first day, we passed hikers who had spent the night in the backcountry, and they looked like they were suffering from mosquito-induced post-traumatic stress disorder. Our intended destination of Sunrise Campground was a living hell, as they put it. When we arrived at the location, it was eerily deserted, despite the attractive campsites and the elegant solar composting toilet. Our legs were exhausted, but we couldn't stop. The infernal buzzing drove us onwards and upwards, towards hope of some mosquito-free sanctuary. Normally, I come equipped with lightning-quick slapping reflexes, but these insects have been bred through natural selection to such heightened levels of intelligence and deviousness that they could outwit the most exceptional human hiker. They bested me time and time again, perching unnoticed until they were already halfway through their meal. Our DEET-laced insect repellent failed to phase them. Within seconds of application, they were already touching down upon the treated skin. We made camp on a rocky ridgeline, far from the marshy meadows and ponds where mosquitoes bred. But the insidious creatures found us anyways. I took my turn cooking stroganoff noodles, and Kitty, weakened from the altitude, took shelter inside the tent. I am not coming out, she announced. And she was true to her word. Thirteen hours passed before she unzipped the tent door to step outside, and that was only because her bladder finally compelled her. 
The next morning, there were 50 mosquitoes clinging to the tent fabric, staring down at us like hungry cats beside a fishbowl. That number soon doubled, then tripled. We hastily fled with our packs to the Sunrise Lakes and took a moment to skinny dip in the frigid waters, scrubbing off layers of ineffectual bug repellent. We simply hadn't counted on the mosquitoes being so audacious. And it wasn't just the mosquitoes. 150 years of overexposure had made most of the local wildlife fearless in the presence of humans. A coyote paddled along the shore 15 feet away from us while we bathed, and he didn't even glance in our direction. This wasn't out of any sense of modesty. The canine just didn't care one way or another. The day before, we witnessed a large buck kicking at the earth, unconcerned that we were standing only 10 feet away. Its antlers were not fully grown, they were blunted and covered with fuzzy velvet, but the creature was still fearless. And at our campsite near Half Dome the second night, we were warned about a pesky bear that had become immune to the banging of pots and pans and was known to barge into cooking areas looking for scraps. We camped there anyways. At that point, we were more worried about mosquitoes than bears, and after climbing the lofty summit of Cloud's Rest earlier in the day and dodging additional battalions of airborne adversaries, we were too exhausted to search for another place to pitch our tent. We chose a prominent granite outcropping shaped like a volcano that had cinders from an old campfire sitting in the summit caldera and just enough flat space for a tent upon one of its flanks. It took us a few minutes to realize the most unusual feature about this boulder. There were no mosquitoes. Whenever we stepped down from the rock, we were eaten alive. Atop it, we were inexplicably untouchable. We'd found an island in a sea of blood-sucking insects. Together, Kitty and I brought the volcano back to life, returning fire to the summit caldera. We threw dead fall branches into the flames to appease the mosquito gods and sat on the rim of the volcano and watched the drama unfold in the neighboring campsites below. The infamously intrusive bear wandered by at dusk and bumped into our closest neighbor's tent while they were sleeping, but we remained undisturbed by mammal or insect. It had been an unquestionably good week for wildlife viewing but there's much to be said for keeping critters of all sizes at a safe distance, especially the bloodthirsty ones. Hey friends, thank you. Thank you for all you do to keep the Adventure Sports Podcast alive and well. You listen to our amazing guests. Thanks for that. You join our Facebook group and you share your adventures. That's awesome. You join our ASP members community for discounts and to support the show. Very cool. You donate to our Patreon site. Right on. But most of all, Thank you for believing in the show. Thank you for joining with us to reach others to share the great stuff that adventure sports bring. We believe that adventure sports help people to live richer, more fulfilling lives. We believe that the Adventure Sports Podcast is making a positive impact in the world through physical health, emotional health, environmental health, and relational health. We have set the challenging goal of doubling our listener base by February the 28th. Wow, really? After nearly three years, we want to double the number of listeners in just a few weeks? You bet. And you make it possible because you believe in ASP. Thanks in advance for sharing the dream of a healthier, happier world by telling your friends about the Adventure Sports Podcast. Let's double the good. Together, we can do it. You know, we might be smack dab in the middle of winter these days, but spring is really just right around the corner. Make sure you've got one of our lightweight camp stoves ready to go in your pack for when the weather starts turning warmer. Both the 180 stove and the 180 flame are designed to burn the abundant wood fuels you find on the ground instead of requiring you to haul in heavy, messy camp fuels. Take a minute to head on over to our site at www.180tack.com to check out these American-made stoves that are built to last. You'll be helping us, and you'll be helping the Adventure Sports Podcast. Thanks, guys. The next story from Falling Off the Map takes place up in Northern California. And it's one of the weeks when I was helping lead a group of uh, teenagers on some outdoor adventures. The chapter is called Week 3. Bovine Intervention It was a moment to be proud of. On their own, the teens had discovered a ring of giant redwood trees, including a stout specimen that had toppled, creating a bridge from the forest floor up to the shoulder of Sir Francis Drake Boulevard. They laughed and carefully walked up the log, 
while I looked on from below and took pictures. Away from the distractions of cell phones and wireless internet, these teenagers were having a positive, adventurous experience on the first day of their camping trip, gaining confidence in themselves as they explored an unfamiliar environment. All that the other chaperones and I had to do was to step back and let them take the lead. Shrieks of nervous excitement came from Gianna, who was eight feet above the ground and understandably nervous about falling. Her friends stood above and below her along the log, but could not continue past while she was flailing her arms. I took a step closer and lowered the camera. Something was wrong about the tone of Gianna's screams. Then I saw the wasps swarming about her head. Oh no. The log was booby-trapped. Either Gianna or the boy above her had stepped on a yellow jacket nest, although the girl was currently receiving the brunt of their fury. The other students looked stunned. Everyone get back, I ordered. As soon as I could squeeze onto the log, I ran up to Gianna, who was standing and screaming, but not moving from her position. Perhaps she knew that if she tried to move her feet in her present state of panic, she would have fallen to the ground and broken several bones. Failing to budge the girl, I swung my body around hers to shield her from the yellow jacket nest, and I pushed the teenager a little to encourage her to start walking down the log. Wasps hovered around us like helicopters, swaying from side to side before going in for the kill. Gianna began to step forward, and I held her protectively, hoping we could both maintain our balance during the onslaught. It didn't help that I occasionally had to remove a hand from her shoulders so I could crush the wasps that were actively stinging me. Somehow, we managed to reach the forest floor. The trip leader, River, took Gianna into custody and fled down the trail with the wasps in fast pursuit, bravely enduring several stings herself, while I helped gather the other teenagers along the side of the nearby State Park Road. We reunited at our campsite, and despite having over 20 stings, Gianna soon found her smile again, thanks to the camaraderie of the group and to her own indomitable spirit. Sapped of adrenaline, we slept hard that night despite our lingering pain and itchiness. We woke before dawn the next morning in order to kayak across Tamales Bay and rebuild our camp on the soft sands of the Point Reyes Peninsula. Point Reyes National Seashore, north of San Francisco, was established to preserve public access to the beaches and to keep the dairy ranches from becoming subdivided and developed. An alliance between the Sierra Club, the ranchers, and the federal government in 1962 helped to protect over 70,000 acres of open space, with the caveat that most dairy and cattle operations on the peninsula would be allowed to continue. As a result of this arrangement, our tents were confined to a fenced-in, narrow strip of land along the shoreline, while cows ruled the hills above our campsite. That evening, we huddled around our campfire, eagerly awaiting the advent of nightfall, when we would take to the sea once more to witness the spectacle of bioluminescent plankton. At last, our kayak guides came and roused us, but before we could down our life jackets, someone noticed a cluster of strange shapes illuminated by the light of our neighbor's campfire down the beach. I took a few steps in their direction. Wait a minute. Were those cows? River and I walked over with one of the kayak guides to investigate. Sure enough, our only neighbors had a genuine cow infestation on their hands. A fence gate must have been left open somewhere in the adjacent hills, and a hundred head of cattle now stood twenty feet from our position, visibly eager to pass us by but too wary of the campfire flames to make the first move. An oversized bull emerged from the herd and broke the stalemate, trotting dangerously close to the nearby tents and disappearing into the darkness. Others soon followed, making containment impossible. I retreated with River back to our group, and our guides spent the next hour trying to contact the local ranchers. I overheard one part of the cell phone conversation. You want to know what they look like? Well, they're black and white. Our neighbors soon decided to surrender their campfire to the bovine invaders and take refuge around our fire, allowing the cows to advance and absorb their newest territory. They paraded like demons in the glow of the distant flames while their bull general walked up to the fence at the base of the hill and tried to convince the adjoining herd to crash the barriers and join forces with them. When a hooved soldier crossed the sands and threatened to overrun our camp, River decided it was time to push back. Clapping her hands and shouting, she made the creature spin around and scamper off. That turned the tide. Together with the help of our neighbors, we herded the vanguard away from our side of the beach and even convinced the bull that it was in his best interest to retreat. The great bovine empire collapsed in upon itself. I got into the cowboy spirit, whooping and chasing the cows from our neighbor's land. A couple of us pursued the beasts across a muddy inlet and corralled them into a narrow marsh. I hoped we would find an open gate so we could force them through and seal the entryway, 
but the cows suddenly decided that they would go no further. Realizing that it might not be the best idea to back a 2,000-pound bull into a corner, I wished my neighbors good luck and left the front lines to rejoin my campmates. The local ranchers finally received word of the incursion, and I glimpsed the headlights of their ATVs winding down the hillside just as our group pushed off from the shore in our kayaks and entered the still waters of Tamales Bay. The instant my paddle touched the water and set off a bloom of bluish-white phosphorescence, I was transported to a world of utter magic. The chaotic realms of cows and yellow jackets drifted away. Every disturbance to the ocean's surface created a billowing ball of light consisting of thousands of shining sparks, and wielding the blades at each end of my kayak paddle, I became a sorcerer of limitless power. I felt as if I had been waiting for this moment all my life without knowing it. The shallow waters of Tamales Bay create the perfect warm environment in which a bioluminescent plankton species, the dinoflagellate, is able to thrive, and the narrow passage to the open sea helps confine these organisms to the bay. When disturbed, the dinoflagellates combine chemicals within their bodies to produce light. This behavior might confuse their predators, or it might serve to attract larger creatures, like toothed whales and dolphins, that might eat their predators. I was so mesmerized by the phenomenon that I started to annoy our guides by falling behind the group and occasionally crashing into the cliffs along the shore. The manipulation of bioluminescence was addictive. Each forceful thrust of my paddle created glowing pressure waves that I could send hurling through the water towards the other craft. A scoopful of water splashed onto my chest, spawned a dozen pinpricks of light that ran down my clothes before jumping back into the safety of the bay. On this starless, moonless night, I felt like the luckiest person on earth. I could have stayed out there till dawn, but we had an early morning departure ahead of us. The next day, Gianna and I paddled to the mainland in the same kayak. Her voice was hoarse from all the screams she had unleashed two days ago, but she still chattered incessantly. Even though I could barely understand the words she said over the sound of the wind and the waves, I faked comprehension in order to keep her talking so that she wouldn't be nervous about the rough seas. Gianna may have needed a little help, but she had grown and learned much about herself this week. She had gained confidence in her own abilities despite the wasps and waves. I had gained something from the week as well, and it wasn't just a fat paycheck that I could use to subsidize my own summer travels. It was a reminder that a world of terrible stings still holds the most beautiful magic. We left the bioluminescence behind when we departed to Tamales Bay, but I think the spirit of optimism and wonder was something Gianna and the others would carry with them for a long time to come. Thanks again for listening. If you'd like to read more tales of misadventure, the first off-the-map book, along with my guidebook, Renegade Car Camping, are available for free to my newsletter subscribers. Sign up and get your free digital copies at offthemapbooks.com. Paperback editions of the whole Off The Map trilogy can be found at amazon.com. Safe travels, everyone. All right, that'll do it for Brian Snyder's Saturday ASP Stories readings. If you want to get more information about Brian and his books, you can visit him at offthemapbooks.com. You can also hear his interview episodes on number 135 and number 302. Coming up next Saturday, we've got Sam Manicom starting. He's going to be reading a few chapters over a few weeks from his books about motorcycling adventures around the world. Until then, guys, get out and have some fun. Thanks for listening. <laughs>